regarding the K grant mechanisms. Um, our panelists have all received K awards from the NIH and um, will answer some questions that you have and we also have some questions that were submitted. The format for this is very interactive and very open so although I will introduce some questions, um, feel free to jump in and ask any questions that you have as we go along. I'm Stephanie Friel, the Program Director for Faculty Mentoring, and I'll start out with our first question by asking the panelists if they could please introduce themselves and describe a little bit their, um, their research background and their experience with the K-Grant mechanism. You want to start, Dennis? Sure. Uh, so, I'm Dennis Coe. I've um, been an assistant professor in uh, molecular genetics and microbiology for about two months here at Duke. Um, I got my MD PhD at Stanford. Uh, I got my postdoc at uh, University of Washington, and I uh, applied for the uh, K22 uh, through NIAID. Uh, I work on uh, human variation to bacterial infection. Um, my name is Mickey Konwokowitz. I'm a uh, training pediatric infectious diseases and uh, clinical pharmacology. I am uh, part of the faculty at the Clinical Research Institute and at the Department of Pediatrics. I've been at Duke for the past six years, the first three uh, for my PTIB fellowship and then the last three years on faculty. Um, and my main line of research is uh, clinical and it involves the pharmacology of drugs in uh, children. Uh, my name is Chad Perodigat. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Internal Field Medicine, which is part of the OBGYN department, so I do high risk obstetrics. I've been at Duke, I did finish my residence on a clinician. I finished my residency in 2003 and I took a little bit different path. I worked as an academic generalist for a few years before coming back for fellowship. And then during my fellowship, I became interested in basic research and went to the, um, joined the lab with Howard Rockman in cardiology. Um, and I look at, um, so the role of um, uh, uh, ALS and BA, oxytocin receptor desensitization. So we give continuous dosing of oxytocin later explaining the molecular mechanisms why that occurs. Um, when I finished fellowship, I started on the BIRCH program here at Duke, which is an institutional K-12 program. And then from there, I kind of transitioned and applied for an individual K-8. So I just started my career. Uh, my name is Liz Cerulli. I got my PhD here at Duke in human genetics. And I stayed on to do a postdoc for a couple of years. And then just in August, I became an assistant professor here. Um, I applied for a KO1, and the research I do is usually um, looking at uh, in entirely sequenced uh, genomes and exomes and trying to find genetic variants that contribute to whatever trait it is that I'm looking at. Usually it's some kind of disease, but um, I'm also very interested in normal variation between people, uh, things like cognition, um, face recognition, uh, giving this and not disease traits. Uh, my name is Steve Choi, I'm uh, currently uh, I'm faculty in visual gastroenterology and internal medicine. Uh, like Chad, actually, I, uh, I've been at Duke a while too. I did my uh, internal medicine residency training here and GI fellowship. I uh, started at uh, a T32 uh, training grant as a fellow uh, with, with, my, with the, uh, my mentor, who was, it, who was my mentor then and continues to be my mentor. I am a deal. My uh, research interest is primarily in liver fibrosis and. Uh, and, and uh, Mechanisms and, and, and key regulators of, of uh, progressive drug disease. So I, I do. I'm, I'm currently on day away. I've been. A, this is currently my fourth year of five. Uh, Thank you. Um, I'll open up with one of the questions that we have submitted in general. Can you describe your K application process? How long it took, whether you were awarded your first submission or after a revision, and any really important things that you've learned along the way that would be helpful for those who are preparing applications today? And this is open for any of you to answer. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, I applied for the, the K-22. Um, Initially, early on in my uh, postdoc, I was thinking I might apply for the, K, the K-08, actually. But the, the year before, uh, I did an MD PhD, but I didn't do uh, any clinical training. And then they stopped allowing um, MD PhDs without licensing to apply for that mechanism. 
But it ended up being better that way because now I have money now as an assistant professor when I really need that money as opposed to as a postdoc in a lab with tons of money. Um, so I applied for the K-22 um, June 2010 with the intention of applying for jobs that fall. And I was hoping, you know, if it would get funded and I'd feel happy, I'd be able to sell it to people essentially applying for faculty positions. But then Congress sort of broke down and the, yeah, it just took a really long time and to get the, the pay line established for that year. So I ended up um, getting my scores back. In most years they would have been funded, but the PO wasn't quite sure. So I revised it and submitted it again. But by then, Congress finally got its act together and decided to fund it. Um, and then, uh, and then, and so I, I applied for jobs again the following year. I didn't get any interviews that first year, but I think it really helped having the K the second time around. Then, it, then I got uh, several interviews here. Um, and then the K twenty two is kind of an interesting mechanism in that you apply for it, you submit your career development plan and your um, science plan. Um, but then they expect you to find a permanent fact, well, a tenure track faculty position in order to actually get that money. So you have to basically get the position and then you uh, submit the second part of the application explaining how you're being supported by your department and all that. So even though I initially applied in fall 2010, I finally started getting the money for that this, this last month. So it took about two years to get the money eventually. <laughs> I started, as I mentioned, I started on an institutional K award. So there's a number of training grants that are available that are awarded to institutions. And at Duke, there's a number of them. The Birch is one. Um, I believe there's one at the Ice Center, especially in the clinical side. I um, started on that with the goal of transitioning. A lot of these programs are geared to get people going and then apply for your own funding to so more and more people at the institution can cycle on. And so I was encouraged through the Birch program to early on apply for a K-08. I think I've been on the Birch maybe a year working on the grant and the grant came in I think February 2011. Um, it was not funded the first time and um, I think the rubber tank sheets which are kind of hilarious but they love the mentors and the institution but the weakest component of the applicant of the application was the candidate. I felt like <laughs> of all the things in the, in the application that was the one thing I couldn't fix. Um, but and that's when I picked up the phone and spoke with the program officer and I hadn't, despite you know, the, the, um, the grant writing workshops tips about getting a hold of your program officer very early, I did not get a hold of the program officer with the first submission and it was very helpful. He, was at the, he had been at the meeting and said, look, this is what you need to do to make the application stronger. Um, quickly we um, turned it around that November and was funded. And so, so I think that speaking with the program officer was very, very, was very helpful. So, quick follow-up question: With the K-12, is there a and then the K-08, is that right? Yeah. How, how much time are you allowed to take in the K-08, and does the K, how do you have the K-12 affect that? Yeah, so every institute is different. Um, I, my funding is through the NICHD, and the NICHD allows six years of total combined funding. If you're applying just for your own individual K award, they only allow five years. But if you've been on some sort of a training mechanism, uh, on K-12 beforehand, they allow um, six years. What's very interesting in the study section is that, that the typical, for birth scholars, at least here at Duke, the triple typical trans, uh, uh, path has been to apply for an individual K award. And you can see from the study section that they were extremely divided about whether that was appropriate. Half of this, they felt like that a lot of the study section felt like that K-12s were your training award and you should be applying for R1 funding, which they made it very clear that I was not a candidate for. Um, but the other half felt like that it was an appropriate mechanism. And I initially applied for a lot for a full five years on my K-08 and they didn't allow that. And so we knocked down the budget on the resubmission for three years. And so how my board is working, I spent three years on the Burge and then three years on the K-08, which is just starting. So question, you said you were kind of a clinician and you were Yeah, and so that's probably the same for, um, so, you know, I have, so it's, um, I'm, a clinic, we're, I'm a clinician and the, the grant allows for 75% protected time. 
And then the, the other 25% is made up of um, clinical work and teaching, the responsibilities. Um, you need a division head that's respectful of that. And, um, and luckily I've been in a division that's extremely uh, supportive of that. Where you certainly hear other stories where <coughs> research time is even up. Right, so we going back to um, what helped to get the kidney people going. So I would say a really good and savvy mentor, and I'll get into the details of why, and then having a department that's going to really support your efforts. Because you go through all these processes, apply for the K23, you actually have to have a letter from your chair saying that they're going to protect your time. You know, 75, it's better to say even 80 or whatever percent above the 75. So that the NIH is really, um, they can be reassured that you're going to spend all that time doing research. And if, if that's a commitment that then is broken, the institution is liable for not uh, holding that commitment. And so if somebody's going to put that on paper, they better follow up with that when you get your award. Um, I said the group mentor not only because we're going to get into details about how that helps you with how to prepare the application. This was a mentor that had done it before with other trainees. So when I came into my research team, they had already won two Ks for two other group members. So they kind of knew how to prepare a case. And that's, to me, that was key. When I, su I submitted my K23 the last day of my fellowship, and it got reviewed. Uh, out of the three reviewers, I got good scores from two of them and the very poor score from the primary reviewer, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and after several, um, very savvy um, questioning by my mentor at NIH, etc. We found that it was a conflicted reviewer that didn't recuse himself from the review. So then he had to step out and the application had to be re-reviewed through the same submission. But now we went to a special emphasis panel of three experts in the field that I was applying for, rather than a study section that pretty much had a mix of different people. And then they reviewed it and then they gave me the award, but then it took a year for me to finally get the K. And during that year, I was lucky enough that my mentor had enough grant money that he actually paid for my salary for the first year so that I can do a lot of the research, and then I got my K. So having a, a good mentor that has plans B, C, and D uh, for you, I think it's uh, extremely helpful. For the protected time issue, what I did is I put my decision um, director, he's part of my mentoring team, and so by doing that, I think it, it helps show that he was committed to, to my research and to be willing to was then going to provide that for time. Yeah, I think uh, different from from I guess making it in, in Chan is that uh, I guess I, our our division actually has a pretty strong presence at the VA hospital, so the VA hospital uh, it is actually a, a great place. Uh, that's where I do all, pretty much all of my clinical work. The VA hospital was a great uh, transition for me to, to get uh, clinical time and then to get protected by uh, my mentor, who's also our, our division chief. And then I have a, my division chief over at the VA. They're both physician scientists, so they're very familiar with the, uh, with, with the amount of time that I need uh, protected. And the VA itself has uh, a lot of built-in protection. So I think for me, it was it was relatively easy to transition and, 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 and carve out some uh, with enough, enough protected time, I suspect. Uh, with with, uh, with uh, Chad and Mickey too, uh, the clinical time, the clinical work will always be there. And it, it really is probably more for me. It's, it was more uh, my my chiefs uh, did a fine job protecting me. It was just more how much was I willing to protect myself. There's always you know one one extra thing you could probably end up feeling like you could do, but uh, but that's where actually your mentor does a the print that has the rubber reel you in as well. And say, well yeah, focus it. And I, so I, I've never had a problem feeling feeling protected. Uh, Active fellows over at the VA that uh, help run a lot of the, uh, and it's just a matter of providing supervision to them. Uh, this is also what I'm concerned when I started, and now our, our faculty is, is much bigger now for VA as well, uh, certainly since, since I've been on the K. So, when you first started thinking about applying for a K, how did you know when you were ready as far as publications and research experience? And what do you think is the most critical factor in being ready to apply for a K? So I, I, you know, I've applied only for one K, and I can, I'm, what I'm going to 
talk about today probably reflects more of our team experience rather than just one. But one thing that really resonated with me when I was thinking about uh, research and I was during the fellowship is that my mentor said, you don't write a gate in three, three months before the application, you write it two years before. And not necessarily write it, the application itself, but you have to really think about what you're going to do two years before because you should have a strong candidate by the time that you apply in terms of the number of publications that you need to have, uh, the number of people that you need to know so that you can demonstrate that people that you're saying that are going to mentor you, that you have worked with them before. And a good way of showing that is that they're part of your publication. So if you try to assemble all that, just by putting slapping on names on the application, I mean, they can say all they want in their letters, like, I work with you and all that. But if you have a publication that shows both of your names, I think that that's a very strong statement to NIH that you are really going to work together, that you have done this before, and that they're not questioning whether that's going to fall apart after they give you the money. So I think planning in advance, uh, because I think the majority of the time, I mean, the science is sort of important, but I think what NIH wants is for you to get trained, for you to have solid mentorship, for you to have protective time, so that then you can move forward to independent uh, research. Yes, if you don't have a Um, so, you, so I, I can talk about, uh, so the kidney tree is a, a patient-oriented uh, award, meaning that we do clinical research. So if you collaborate with somebody on a project that may not have resulted in a publication, whether it was a clinical trial or even maybe like a QI project of the institution, that's something that could probably go uh, on, a, on the letter, or if you have an abstract with them, maybe that can be somewhat included. Um, but. Um, so, so I, don't, I wouldn't say that you have to have the publications, but I think certainly a strength when, when you go into it. And, and what, again, going back to the preparation, it didn't, have to be, it didn't have to be an original paper. It was actually a review paper that my mentor said, write a review paper, get you know, these three people involved, and then all those three people are going to be in your external advisory committee. These are the experts in the field. And then it was kind of easy because then he had access to a journal that wanted to publish that paper, and then it was kind of done. So I don't think that they'll go into the details to see what kind of paper you publish with them, but doing something along those lines, I think, is helpful. I think it'd be uh, useful if uh, we had a sense of who's applying for like mentored awards versus not mentored. So, so my award was not mentored. I'm just wondering what the sort of makeup of this audience is. Because you know, the two things require different sorts of things. So how many of you are doing mentor awards? And any non-mentor case? <laughs> so mostly mentor. <laughs> uh, well, to address the, the, the initial question, I guess when I knew I was ready, I think it was more because my, uh, my mentor was also my division chief who was planning to hire me, so she, uh, I think she actually helped make the decision of, of when I was ready. So uh, I, uh, I sort of, in, in GI, we sort of typically do our, it's a three-year fellowship, we do our initial years, and it's our full clinical year, and then, uh, then divided it over the next two years, we, we do 18 out of 24 months of, of research. I did my uh, fellowship a little bit backwards. I, I spent the first 18 months in, uh, doing research and then finishing my last year as a full clinical year. And I can sort of remember back while I was doing my full clinical year, I was meeting uh, every morning, every Friday morning at 7 a.m. for two hours with my mentor, pretty much for 40, 48 weeks uh, of the year we were working on my, on my keyboard. So I think, as Mickey has pointed out, it, it, it's certainly more than a year process. But uh, I think sort of uh, surviving those meetings, I think, really made me realize I was probably ready. And, and if I wasn't, uh, you know, um, that, you know, I, I think I probably would have just not shown up and, and, and probably would not be here today or be looking elsewhere for, for employment or would have certainly been looking elsewhere for employment. But uh, I, I think sort of, uh, in terms of, I, I think, in, in, so I, I, this is sort of my fourth year on, uh, on, on the K Award, and sort of just sort of thinking back, I think the advice I had gotten back then, I, I had gone to, uh, our division didn't have actually a lot of strength, uh, didn't have a great track history of producing people. Uh, we had a great track record of putting people on a training grant and then eventually seeing them go out into private practice and, and making certainly more money than they, they would have had they stayed in academic. So, uh, we didn't have a, a great track record, so it was it was difficult for me to, to go to immediate peers who because uh, frankly I was one of the first ones to actually 
to, to go through this process. Um, so I, I didn't really have a great uh, uh, perspective, or, or and certainly had no so no one immediately above me to serve as a role model. So it was, it was a very difficult time, so a trying process in terms of knowing how to go through the process, uh, and, and sort of certainly felt isolated. But I think that's the sort of the key thing was having the strength of a very strong mentor, someone who. Uh, uh, I think sort of serves as a, at the same time as, as sort of a providing guidance on your side on, on science and at the same time as she was an important uh, cheerleader as well. So just uh, getting up at 7 a.m. Uh, on a weekly basis uh, without some of that, uh, you know, the, the rara that she was supporting, I think it was, was critical. And I think that sort of also further helped motivate me to know that I was ready to, that this was something I wanted to do uh, with my career and, and, and came for was, was sort of a natural for me, it was a natural mechanism to, to enable me to, to do to do the clinical part that I enjoy, and then, and then as well as to get the time to do research. I did have one publication with her at, at that time, and I think that was sort of obviously a, a critical step because it was in an area that she's now gotten into. But when I was working with her, it was in, in the, she was not a liver fibrosis person, but uh, my work was particularly liver fibrosis at the time. So she did not have. She was very well regarded in terms of liver. Uh, so much of fibrosis, so that was that was a bit of a challenge. But the fact that we were able to get fibrosis paper published, uh, I think that sort of also helped me realize that I think we were ready to, 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 to go forward with the case. The timing, I also used my, my clinical fellowship time as two years of research to establish the relationship with Howard, who was then going to be my mentor on my, on my K, and then once the fellowship was finished, he, together with my division chief, said, well, now's the time to put that together. I was also told I should see my head and come up with it. So it sounds like the, the mentors that you choose are, are critical to the process. So I wonder how did you choose your mentor and what role in your K application did a, any larger mentoring community, either a committee or just ad hoc mentors play in your application? Mine was kind of straightforward. Um, when I came here for a fellowship, when I came here to interview, um, I'm not a U.S. citizen, so I wasn't on a visa that didn't allow my to get NIH funding. So when I was interviewing for fellowship, that was a big um, limitation because I couldn't get on a training grant at T32, so I pretty much had to work on getting uh, funding out of private foundations, etc. So interviewing for fellowship with that limitation of a visa uh, can sometimes be uh, difficult. So when I was interviewing and then I came here, uh, Danny Benjamin, who is my mentor, who has been my mentor ever since, um, he was the only one that said, I, I don't really care about your visa, I'm going to find the money to fund you. So that kind of just, and then we clicked it in an A review, and then just, just kind of how he was chosen, but it's, I, I didn't have like five different people to choose from. Uh, after I took the position of the fellowship, then I was still uh, at my residence in Peru, and I started working with him from there. And and then that's just you know I was lucky that we clicked. I was lucky that um, he was a very uh, he is a very upfront type of mentor. Um, so that kind of went along with my personality, and we just kind of hit it off. And from there, it just kind of evolved. And then in terms of involving other mentors, I think for my application that was key. So he knew. Uh, people that had sat on NIH committees before that had reviewed case, uh, and he actually had my application reviewed by one of them, and he we got feedback because he does that for other groups for other universities as well. So they kind of returned the favor <coughs> with my application, and uh, he sat with me on a weekly basis going over the application like six months before we went in to make sure that every paragraph was in place, every picture was where it's supposed to be. So um, again. I didn't really have to choose a mentor because it just kind of was there, but that's how it evolved. Well, mine is kind of an unusual situation. Um, so the person I did my PhD with has evolved from being a lab into being a center, and so it was kind of, I was able to stay in that same environment um, instead of moving on elsewhere, yet still become uh, an assistant professor and kind of starting my own research in that area. So since he's now, he was my, um, advisor, PhD advisor, and now he's uh, 
head of the center. It was obvious to keep him on as my main mentor for my gear work. Um, I chose a couple other people that I had collaborated with over the years um, as, as my other mentors. And I would say that my mentors didn't play an enormous role in my application. Um, they gave me feedback, but I'm not sure that they read the entire thing through. Um, they didn't do like paragraph by paragraph edits or anything like that. Um, I got more kind of like big picture feedback from my mentors on what I what I should change and how, how I should develop it. Um, yeah, so that's the little difference. Well, I think from my perspective, my, my mentor, again, she, she's very well-renowned. Uh, she has got a great track record of, of, of maintaining R1 funding. And so I, I think so if I could have certainly gone back and to do it all over again, I, I think she's, she's an excellent scientist by, by all means. But I think, uh, in, in, obviously, uh, hindsight, we were, we were probably writing more of an R1 than a, than a K award. So because we spent all this time focusing on, on the science part, on the science part, then when, I, when we first submitted the, the award, we were really like the science was, was just a little Where's the career plan? So this is, and it just shows some of the. Uh, I think that was at that time I did not. I, I had a, a committee of one uh, as well, and a committee of one. And so that sort of uh, for the next iteration, uh, for, for my resubmission, we, we we actually ended up completely changing the science as well. But uh, probably more importantly, we actually ended up focusing more as much as Chad pointed out the candidate. So uh, so I, I think honestly, what what I uh, what I recall hearing uh, about. Uh, when I went through the K, at least the K away process, I had I funded through the NIEK that uh, the NIEK, would, I'm not sure if it's relevant to, to, to set funding agencies you might be going through, but ultimately what, one of the things that, that, that you're sort of told by others uh, at other institutions is at least in the NIEK, case, so if, you, if you've got a strong mentor, a strong mentoring plan, uh, in the science, and if the science is, is, is adequate, it, it, it can sort of, you know, in some ways it's sort of a, a a process where you just want your turn in line, but you know, obviously, when you get your patients back, <laughs> you you really you, you you do tend to really wonder about that. But I think probably the, the biggest improvement I made in, in my revision was again focusing on myself and, and how I was going to uh, take advantage of some of the institutional resources that we have here uh, to to develop upon my, to, to to improve myself and to get myself to the point of being independent of uh, uh, programs like this. Obviously, the uh, I think we, we emphasize the, the GOAT writing class, which I suspect many of you are aware of. So, emphasizing a lot of the, the things that Duke actually has, uh, I think actually made a significant uh, impact on, on my ability to get the money. Because, as I said, the science was, was probably, um, and, and if I were to go back and look at my K work, and my initial K work now, I think the science was probably, again, sort of focused at, at almost an R01 level. Uh, but what, what, what I found with the, the, and I, the, the my, my revision was by focusing more on, on how I was going to develop myself and then the mentoring committee, uh, it, I think that was probably as important and not more so uh, than, than, than the actual science and specific games. So uh, my postdoc and mentor actually didn't have any, any comments on, on my uh, draft. Uh, but what was really helpful though is um, uh, a friend from grad school got a similar care with the year before. So essentially just getting his uh, what he wrote and asking him questions. You know. So he sort of became my de facto mentor in this process. And, he was really um, and just to echo what you were saying about, about the um, candidate, it's, uh, yeah, basically you, know, you scored on these three different measures, the, the candidate, the career plan, and, and, the, um, and the science. And basically the, the career plan, you should get ones, scores of ones on the career plan, since it's just kind of a little bit of, um, you know, there's just certain things they want to hear in there. And so if you've seen good versions of the career plan, it's just very easy to modify that to be your own. Um, yeah, so that's the part of, part of it that's the least work that you kind of have the most control over if you don't get scores of ones on that thing. Um, that's kind of sad. So just to follow up on that, um, I think that the way that you candidate career development plan career goals section was the most difficult to write and what do you, which part do you think has the most impact on your evaluation as a, as a candidate in this process? Well, I, I think from my perspective, uh, I think it was sort of uh, being identifying mentoring a, a committee. That's something I didn't necessarily do my first time, I think, uh, uh, 
with my first uh, submission and I revised it, coming up with a with a mentoring committee of people who, who whose careers I wanted to help and emulate. So I, I chose somebody else, a couple of people outside my division, very well respected, uh, and who who wanted to commit some time and, and, and to and to help me develop me in, in committee to uh, writing a letter of support. But obviously, that with my men, my my primary mentor being focus. So I, I think that's sort of, uh, you know, I. My initial submission, I, I sort of, uh, because I was so focused on the science part that I, I, I actually had looked at a colleague of mine, actually a pediatric ID, who had gotten a K award, and I saw his, his career plan. So he, again, I, it was one of those things where, at the time, it was we didn't think it. We thought that if we could blow them away with the science, the career plan, that you know, what, who cares about the career plan? But I, I think sort of uh, picking and, and choosing it. And, 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 Things that are particularly relevant for the type of science that you're doing. So uh, you know, I made the mistake of, of almost, almost just templating what, what, what was what was done in a previous uh, successful case. Where we, clearly, some of those things were not like some of the coursework was, really was not going to be uh, terribly relevant for, for my career at all. So it, 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 it sounded good. You know, did catch some of these courses, but uh, some of the uh, what the what the, uh, what the, what the initial was really like, how is this class really going to help you? see this helping. So I, I think so again we have a little bit smarter than again focusing on some of the things on the things that actually will will matter specifically very well. So meeting with a uh, mentoring committee uh, at every three months portal was, was probably much more useful than than, than uh, doing coursework that, that looked good on paper. And I think at the end of the end you can just yeah the community was pretty aware of that. Um, I, I would agree that the career plan is easy if you have feedback. Um, but the first time I did my K-Award, I, I think I've been exposed to one K-Award before. I had really no contact with people who got, had successful K's. I hadn't seen successful K's. I didn't know what was really required, so I kind of made up a career plan. Um, that one, one, of course, not really fitting at all what they were looking for. So my uh, in my first application, I got good marks on everything except for the career plan. That was the only thing that they we're like, what, what the hell are you talking about here? Um, so uh, I went went back for my for my resubmission and really uh, paid attention to all the all the feedback I could get about exactly how a career plan could go, uh, guidelines of exactly how you should be writing it, and um, put it together the way they wanted it. And uh, they liked it because I wanted I wound up getting a perfect score on my second submission. So I felt like the science section is. Thought was easier to write because that's what you're doing every day and that's what you're focusing your attention on. And number two, before I applied for the, the K Wade, I applied to a foundation grant that it's modeled very similarly. And I also at that point didn't understand the, the importance of the career development plan and they crucified it. And on the on my initial K Wade submission, I think I went the other way and I think one of the reviewers made a comment. I was trying to find the exact wording. But they they worded it in a way that they felt like it was just kind of um, like what everyone at Duke would write, you know, so it wasn't all that unique. So I think it is hard because there are things that there needs to be incorporated in your career development plan, but it's hard to write it in a unique way that sounds that's modeled for your for your career development plan, not for Steve's or not for a PhD or not. You have to really think hard about picking your mentors or your courses or whatever, that, that they, and then really advertise that, that this is going to enhance my career. I will be, I will be, be ready for our work funding at the end of this. So I thought that part of it was difficult. Did any of you have um, people from outside Duke on your advisor committees or as mentors and how did you engage them? So I do. My um, my primary mentor is Howard Rockman, who is in a different department. And I was trying to think how we how we got there, but just similar type of research, even though it's different clinical subspecialties. But we needed someone with reproductive background, through basic science reproductive background, and I, um, there's a woman at UNC, Kathleen Corone. So um, we met with her, and she's she's my second mentor, and so I had to spend a lot of time on the grant, really in clear words, saying how we were going to manage the eight miles difference. 
and initially the first the first submission, one of the reviewers felt like it was too far away, and <laughs> thought in my mind you could have spent how many countless meetings down there in her in her office. But again, I just had to make it really clear that that she is an important aspect of the mentor team, and that we're meeting regularly, and we're meeting regularly. One of my mentors is in Atlanta, and I met him because we had previously collaborated on some uh, cognitive genetics work, and he continues to be interested in the, the uh, cognition and also uh, face recognition, which is one of the things I want to get into. So he seemed to, uh, to be a good fit for that. And actually, on my resubmission, I got advice from someone that I should have a like a second mentoring committee, um, not, on a, not an official one that uh, submitted mentoring letters or anything, but just a second committee that I would say I would interact with uh, a few times a year, and they recommended that that be uh, like completely Duke external and people that I wasn't really actively collaborating with. So I also had um, three people who were completely, well not completely unrelated to Duke, but uh, out of the sides of the country and uh, who I hadn't been collaborating with much. Uh, and I met them through, I don't know, I guess I did meet through two of them through collaborations and the other one I just met when he was visiting here one time. So. Uh, just to get, uh, to get like a, an opinion, kind of to get input on my career uh, from people who weren't vested in me publishing a certain way, like because they weren't, they're not trying to guide me exactly in what I'm doing this for their benefit, um, but so that it would just be out and outside perspective of my career. Oh, you're taking a step back here, but um, it's maybe more practical, it does, but how did you decide to apply for a K-01 and K-22 rather than a K-99? What's the K-99? Yeah, it's the transition from like a postdoctoral um, to an independent faculty. So when I started applying, I didn't know that I was going to be becoming an assistant professor so soon. So I was, I wanted something that would be, that would be kind of flexible, I guess, that could put me towards an independent research career, but without a firm timeline. Why not? Someone like, be doing that. It might be sooner than I thought it would. Yeah, so for me, I, I was planning on applying, um, applying for the K99, uh, but then I, I uh, called the director of the K's at NIAID and asked her opinion. Since they were only funding like one or two K99s every year, so you, know, you have to be in like the top 3% or something like that. Um, but they were really pushing this K22 mechanism, so they don't want to pay the extra postdoctoral years, they just want to pay the, the first two years as an assistant professor. So you know, it was just useful to talk to her to figure out you know, what gets funded for you. And then I also uh, called the similar person, or just emailed actually the similar person at one of the other institutes, um, I forget which one, to figure out if my research was more in line with what they were doing. And um, they, the two of them actually talked about it and then decided which was their appropriate institute. Are K99s only for tenure track? Yeah, I'm not tenure track, so that, that would be another person. Yeah, it's only for tenure track. I also had uh, I had uh, about eight people as uh, in between two mentorship committees, one internal, one external, and the internal was within North Carolina. I had two people from Duke, two people from UNC. And that's because I was doing a combined program in a PhD in pharmacology at UNC. So that's why I needed to have the clinical people here do the PhD UNC people. So that was four, and then I had a person in Kansas City, San Diego, uh, and uh, Utah. Um, and, the, and, and, and that was structured so that I can have the mentorship within my institution, but then everybody else outside were um, really internationally renowned leaders in the field that I was working on. And their goal was, as we said previously, was to kind of mentor you without having the invested interest, or, or it, almost, it almost was structured so that they would have no conflict of interest, so they would just pretty much be really mentorship on, on what you were doing, on your career, on your science, without necessarily having another interest within your institution. Because obviously if you win a K and you have a mentor in your K, that benefits your mentor within your institution. Uh, but for them, it's really just about mentoring you uh, in that regard. And I think that, um, the, so in order for me to be able to put them on the application, my mentor took me to meetings two years before, so I sat with him on a table and he pretty much said, oh, this is everybody that's gonna be in your committee two years from now. And, and that's how it kind of worked. And then over the years, I, those are the people that I wrote papers with, I did review papers, et cetera, so that I could then show. But to me, the most difficult part of writing the candidate and the, that career development plan was actually the details of it. Like, I didn't think that it was gonna be a 
okay, with this person, I'm going to have to write, I'm going to meet with them weekly. With these people, I'm going to I'm going to meet with them every three months. And it has to make sense. So you think that you're just going to say, I'm going to fly out to San Diego every month? Nobody's going to believe that. So, and the UNC thing, it comes up all the time. It's only nine miles, but you have to say that you see them on a weekly basis. Luckily, I was going to a lab meeting with the, the person that was going to be on my K, and you don't think about these things, but they do. So you have to really reassure them that you've done this before, that you've emailed with them, that you've spoken with them, and, and even if it's a, a more of a struggle, if there's like a lab meeting that's already structured, you want to say that, that you have this face-to-face -face time, this amount by email, this amount by phone, this amount in national meetings, like all that needs to be clearly outlined so that you're not saying things that really don't make any sense. So in order for, and I could never have done that if I wouldn't have seen two other kids that were successful. Again, in the line of research that I'm doing, that really, to me, like those details, if, if I wouldn't have seen those applications, I would have completely not done that thing. That's a good to that. So for the specifics of the international experts that are not on your direct team, what are the specifics of those annual or biannual uh, interactions with them? So you say, I'm going to email them with an update or something like that. What is the nature of that? So you, so you have to be very specific. You have to say, I'm going to write a report that's going to describe my progress within the past six months, and I'm going to talk to them by phone for an hour you know, to do that. Or if we go to a meeting, we're going to do that face-to-face, -face, and then he's going to send me feedback officially in writing so that I can take on that and then follow up with that in the, within the next six months. And uh, I think it, it may be... Um, targeted differently for different applicants in terms of how frequent that has to be. I think if they're at different states doing it more than uh, you know three times a year, uh, it's, it's really out there. Uh, I mean, doing it two or three times a year, I think it's, it's reasonable. Uh, but but honestly, I, I was doing what my mentor told me to do with that. You know, this is going to look right. This is what they want to see. So so you're not proposing things that really are crazy. So you guys actually do that stuff? Right. I mean, do you actually follow up out your plan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I have to say that naturally, mine did because I end up. <laughs> 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 uh, so, okay. So I'm not. So I'm not sure if everybody follows. And this is interesting. I'm not sure if everybody follows up on the science of your K, and that may be something that we can talk a little bit about. In terms of the mentorship. For me, it just so happened that I ended up collaborating with everybody that I said that I was going to collaborate because my team became like a network. So, and all those people are on the network. So I do trials with them, and they come here to Durham almost like every couple of months. So I'm actually meeting with them on a more, you know, frequent basis than I said that I would. And then we talk about my career development plans, and I don't think that I put it in writing, but I write emails to them all the time for a million other reasons. So. Now it's more that I actually go on because I want the advice. You know, I'm at a stage where now I'm trying to apply for independent funding and I really want their input. They are reviewing grants that I'm applying for. So it just kind of naturally became really my, my advisor. So I didn't have to really force myself into, into anything. My, my team is are two folks at, at Duke and one at UNC and we're meeting constantly. So it's just it's not something that we have to force every six months, I guess. Is
and I would say like half was between the career development plan and um, the accountability, but there were a lot of figures in the list. Yeah. yeah, I was on the short format as well, but uh, I think this is just the difference between the metric and non-metric, since mine was like two or three pages, um, and you know, there's, there's not all this metric plan in terms of meetings and things like that, so maybe that's why it's just a little bit easier. I was on the uh, yeah, 25 page format too, but I think uh, I probably could have easily trans translated that to the, to the 12 pages because uh, I, I think when I revised it, I, I, we actually ended up going from three specific games to two, and just, we were, I think we were just a little bit smarter and having to learn from, uh, from, from the, first, uh, the first submission and some of the comments that uh, we were probably being a little overly ambitious, and we cut it down a lot. Uh, and, and I made figures very big to, to take advantage of that space uh, back then, but I, I think we you know, probably could have certainly been transitioned into a short format. I spent a lot of time just focusing on, on the career development stuff and, and science sort of you know, taking care of itself. And as we focused, it was better. It sounds like these guys have a big figure one would have been a picture of you actually in their lab meetings. We <laughs> 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 actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> Mentioned, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I guess a couple questions. One, one, one. Uh, mm -hmm. During the key, you do progress reports in each of the um, six or so work a week. And how, how important is that? Uh, so I don't know if it varies by different K mechanisms for the K23, you do it yearly. Um, and it's pretty much just the progress of your research. I, I don't think that there's a lot with regards to the mentorship. I don't I don't know that I've written, oh, I've been a number of times with my mentors. You just kind of say each aim, what has progressed, and even if you are changing the aims along the way, uh, then you can say that. Hi, I have a quick question. Is that the balance between learning and research, does it, like, Varies you know, by the years, for example, like you less or more research, because later you might do more clinical, you know, like, you generate more questions, more applications, or. You know. In my grant, the KOA is pretty clear 75% the entire time, but, you know, honestly, just month to month just slightly depends on what the needs of the division are. If there's vacations or maternity leave or whatever it is, and Maybe there will be one month that I maybe work a little bit more, and then the next month that's my division chief makes sure that I, I work less, and so the average time is so averages out to the 75%. Yeah, I'm sorry, so I don't think, the ones I saw were, I didn't pay attention to whether or not they were close to my research area because it was more about getting the, the structure of what they were proposing right. Um, so for me, I, I don't know, I, didn't, I don't think they were usually very close to my area. I, I applied for a KOA and I used two K23s as my primary templates, specifically for the career development. Um, and they were very clinical projects and mine was basic science, science project. And, Again, I think the, the, the research side is a lot easier, and your primary mentor, that was just easy for them to relate that it was a career development part of the I found more difficult in using these other K23s, even though they were primary clinical research, they were extremely helpful. It's a totally different mechanism. Yeah, I had the same question. I had the same question. Um, so I think I worked on the page sheets actually more helpful from prior K23. Uh, I, I looked at a few others, like, like Chad, I looked at a K23 as well, uh, successful ones, and I think I just used it more to, to look at sort of the template, the style, uh, and, and so um, my goal was actually to make my, my K1 look very easy to read, so one K23 that I looked at, the figures were very, very small, or somehow I get funny, but I, I didn't quite want to do that, but uh, I think it was as useful to actually see the pink sheets and, and see what some of the comments were about about the science, the, the level of how deep you need to go, but I don't know, the mentoring plan and things like that. I think that kind of probably found that more useful sort of thinking about that. I had two from the same, my same research team, 
and two from outside that had nothing to do with my research interest. Uh, and I had access to the team sheets for the two that were within my research team. So the combination of that, so they were all helpful because again, it was more about the structure. But the ones that were really close to what I was doing, it was much easier, of course, to pick out all those details about you know the frequency that I was going to be with people and all that. Not necessarily having to figure that out because I already had to know that there were two other applications that were funded in a similar way. So it was kind of easy to translate that into my own. Yes, for those of us who are doing translational sorts of projects, uh, depending on how you spin it, it could be more clinical or more basic science. And so I'm curious if anyone was in the situation of having to choose between a KO8 or K23 submission and how you made those decisions or if you had any recommendations. I would say call the program officer. They're extremely helpful here from Tannis is that they'll they work with each other and they really want your, your work funded and they'll find the right place to Yeah, I guess it's the Institute. Well, I mean, talking to if, if your project spans institutes, figuring out either through your mentor or somebody else which institutes seem to fund a little bit better, mm -hmm. and then speaking with program officers at different institutes, I think that's what you said, which is, can be really helpful. So they'll help you figure out which which program to apply for and even maybe which institute fits you better. You guys have mentioned working with your program officers. How did you find who you needed to contact, and what were your first? Inter how did you approach them? What were your first interactions with them like? What kinds of things did you ask them about? My um, I mentioned before, my first interaction was when I received the pink sheet from my initial submission. I did not contact the program officer prior, and I certainly wish I had. The ICHD, it's extremely difficult on their website to figure out who your program officer is. And so you, I found out in mine was just by sitting in the grant and he's on, he's on the Commons website. But I think beforehand, in the grant writing workshop, they, they tell you this, just pick up the phone. And if you can't figure out from the website, just call the institute and they will, they will, they're there to help you and they will find the right program officer. Yeah, so um, I basically just looked up at the program announcement for a particular care mechanism, and then there's you know uh, someone in charge of the program at the bottom, which was outdated and like three persons removed. But then, so I emailed them and they basically forwarded it along until it got to the right person. So I, I found with them, it's usually an email is a little bit easier to work out um, in terms of even if you want to speak to them by phone, they kind of appreciate having a little bit of. Uh, time to like hold your file before you call and things like that. So uh, most of my interactions have just been through email. Uh, and um, I, I wish uh, I had probably talked, I wish I had talked to them more about my actual plan and stuff like that beforehand. Most of my interaction has been with like getting human subjects forms in and stuff like that. I was told to come, I was instructed by my mentor to call the program officer six months prior to the first submission with a draft of the specific games page. So in our format, we have this specific games page, which for a lot of grants is just about the science, but here there's like a paragraph about the mentorship itself as well. So it doesn't have to be the final draft, but I kind of send out an email to the program officer and say, can we talk about this by phone? And then uh, she actually set up a time and I was there with my mentor uh, to talk to her about the plan and what he thought about the career development plan and also about the science. And I think that was tremendously helpful because you get a lot of information. I mean, they tell you, well, this is not something that we're likely going to fund. Uh, I think that your career development plan needs X, Y, and Z. Uh, this didn't really come across the way that you're thinking that it's going to come across. So it's, it was just tremendously helpful for me to have that conversation. And since I didn't know anything about what I was doing at the time, it was really good to have my mentor in that part of that conversation because he knew exactly what kind of questions to ask. We, and, and I was too naive to kind of know exactly what I just needed to say. And I thought that the program officer was like this person that, you know, uh, but it, in any event, it was just helpful because otherwise I would have asked like half of the questions that we were going to give me the information that I needed to move forward. And then once you have it, you kind of have like a, I don't want to say a rubber stamp, but 
once you have that specific game space that kind of work, then you can really drive the whole application uh, based on that. Uh, and you already have that input from NIH on how to move forward. Yeah, and it's good to realize that the program officer has nothing to do with the actual review. There's a scientific review officer for that. So, you know, their job is kind of to make sure they get a lot of good applications for that. So they're going to want to help you, and if you ask something that's, you know, uh, that isn't the most savvy or whatever, it's not like they're going to go back to the scientific review officer and say, oh, he asked this or anything. You know, there, there's something. I, uh, I didn't even know what a program officer was when I applied the first time, and it wasn't until he wanted to have a phone call with me to discuss why I didn't get funded the first time that I realized this was someone you could actually talk to who would explain to you what you could do to make your application better. So I really wish I had known that in the first place. It's very helpful. Yeah, I think I had similar experience, though, uh, you know, having uh, going through the process and not having uh, sort of the infrastructure in place in our vision to, to, to do K awards and uh, having a bit more person to do it. I, yeah, I was probably not, I was still not as uh, aware of, of the role of the program on this replacement. But after I think I had my first mission, she was actually quite good at following up with me actually because I, I tend to be uh, much to my mentor's dismay. Uh, I tend to be a bit more laid back and uh, sometimes too laid back. And so she uh, so I had a, uh, the NID case and had an excellent case for that program. Uh, on this one. A follow up to that. Um, I think when, for example, in an NACHD, I feel like there are different sections with different program officers. And um, is there a way to better track your application within a section that you have a higher, you know, chance of being funded through, or is it just contacting that specific program officer and then they look out for your application? Or do you have any other thoughts about that? I thought most uh, most institutes have one officer for K awards, but I might be wrong. Yeah, ours is the NSHD is different. They're, they're reviewed internally, and there's different sections. And to answer, I don't know. Again, I guess calling speaking of the program officers, and, and, and they'll they'll guide it to the right the right section with the NSHD, or maybe a different institute, maybe on the aging or somewhere else. I know one thing in general that you can do, not specifically for K's, is you can get on Reporter and look for research that's very similar to yours, that's offered to the NIH, because it will list under funded grants who their program officers are. So that might be a first step, is to look for um, awarded grants that are similar in scope to yours, and then contact that program officer, and if they're not the right person, they can probably help you find them. And be persistent, because sometimes they, they're very busy people. So if you can send them an email and you don't hear back and you think they don't want to talk to you, and you just turn down and they lost the pin and you know, get to it that day, it's always a good yeah, mine, mine kind of chastised me for only emailing them once and then giving up. It's like, you can email them multiple times. <laughs> My found me at a national meeting and said, oh, this is who you are. So then I came up and issued that side. I actually first met her when we were at a national meeting. She saw my name and said, oh, I've been, I've been waiting to hear from you again. Kind of thing, so. <laughs> I emailed three times and then called and then, and then uh, just got a response. It was basically like, yeah, I've been trying to get in touch with you. I'm like, oh, I've been doing that. <laughs> I have a friend from graduate school who works as a PO now, so it just drives home that they're just plain old people. <laughs> All the talk to them. But remember, too, what they're trying to do. I mean, they, they have a mandate to find the best and the brightest and produce the best applications. And they want to be able to go back to Congress and say, here's who we're training. And these are, this is what they're doing for human, human disease. So they really want really good applications, and they really want to promote people. So I mean, they, they are really there to help. I mean, that's at least in the ideal world. Because they want the best and the brightest to continue forward. So was there anything that surprised you about the application process? Surprised how long it takes. <laughs> but you, you know, planning and submitting and then waiting months and months and months for the review and then waiting to get it back and then 
go through the whole resubmission process again. It's a long process. And even then, when you get your like, kind of score back that they said this likely will be fundable, it took months and months and months to hear whether or not it actually was funded. So I think I was surprised by this. It just along the process. I was actually surprised that it was funded at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but honestly, I, I think it, it goes to show you, I think, um, so probably what's most surprising, obviously, is the, is the pay lines, obviously, for cable is just completely different from what you hear about the R award. So, my, the, so honestly, uh, as I, after I'd gotten the pinchy back my revision of my cable, I was, like, I was actually thinking of exit strategies. Uh, uh, from Duke, frankly, just uh, because I was like, "Wow, with, with this, uh, with this pinky, it's just I can't imagine it being funded." And so I was actually, so I had that year uh, in that in third of the year that K award was uh, that I had submitted, or a few months uh, that after I had submitted, and we were looking at other uh, uh, private foundations for, for, for funding. And I have to honestly say that it, it was essentially the same grant, but we did different versions, and I, I think I probably turned in about twelve different more grants. That during the year and, and getting the pay sheet back, I was thinking, oh, this is terrible. At least, and this is sort of back in the old format, so I did have a third submission, so I was just sort of, I had that moment after the pay sheet, how, how am I going to revise this third, third grant? And then the next month, I get, uh, I got an email from my program, I was, congratulations, you've been funding. So uh, that was just, uh, I think that was probably, that was incredibly surprising. So I, I think what it highlights is, is really that, is that a lot of our institutes do, do place K award funding at uh, a priority. Either uh, they, they do like to they do like to fund uh, trainees and uh, the pay line again. Just to emphasize that the pay line is, is much different because I had gotten used to. If I had, this was the pink sheet that well, my mentor got for R one. There's probably no way that that R one funded but for for some of the comments. Uh, um, I, I think obviously now I would say that those comments are very useful in terms of the career and all. So I would say incorporate some of those into, into, into my, uh, into, since I've been on the cave board, but I would say I think the most surprising thing is that the, the comments don't always uh, uh, equate to whether or not you're right. Uh, it, it, it was, it was, it was one of those, it was, it was actually very positive, obviously. So getting that email, I actually thought it was a hoax initially because I thought somebody in my lab group, they they seemed to, we all sat down and we were looking at things, we were just like, you know, getting the answer of coming at it from my, from my mentor's perspective of, of like, you know, the comments that go over in our ones. It was, it was very surprising, obviously, it was a surprise, so. Um, it, was, it was kind of the opposite for me after submission because I got a really good score and my mentor was like, oh, this is definitely going to get funded. This is going to, absolutely, he was counting on it. And he, he was more disappointed than I was when it wasn't funded because he was so positive about it. There's not a lot of more pessimistic. So, it can, it can flip the other way. <laughs> did you all apply for five years of funding? I, I did the first time and they told me to cut it down so I for the second time. I applied for five. Uh, I mean, uh, with the NIDDK, if, you, if you've been if you've been on an institutional K, you've not uh, you're not eligible for five. But I was able to hold eligible for five years. <coughs> Initially applied for five, but I've been on an institutional K award for a year and a half, and they said absolutely not. And so my institute allows six years of combined funding, and so I I, I applied for three years. So I spent three years on institutional K twelve and three years on. The K-22 is only two years, so that's Good reviews and one bad where they parked a little bit on, on my lack of papers. 
So I was sort of some soul searching like, yeah, am I a slacker? I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I wish someone had sort of sat me down at that point, kind of, you know, slapped me back into reality, you know. Because these people are, are, are there to be critical, you know. They can't find something, they're gonna they're gonna find something. Okay? Um, so just don't take it personally when you get back to the reviews. Same experiment with like Steve. I had a I planned an exit strategy when I got my first summary statement back and I <laughs> applied for or interviewed for a private practice job in Philly and I quickly on my flight home realized that no, I really wanted to be in research and regrouped and sat down and I would say the best advice that I, uh, I never listened to that actually ended up being pretty good advice is so I, I think as, as, as junior faculty or, or trainees or people always tell you that never to write review articles. I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that because I, I don't think it's a bad, I, I don't think it should be, that should be your main form of publication certainly, but I, I think very early on, I, I think it, particularly if you're very selective with who you write a review an article, but that's actually ultimately ends up having a move. If you do, predicting liver fibrosis, if you write a, a one or two uh, review articles in the theory, that these review articles end up getting cited. And this is actually, uh, at least you actually make a name for yourself in the field, sometimes with a, with a good quality, if you're very selective with the type of review article you write. So obviously, there's some folks who will do nothing but write review articles. But if you do write one or two, and, and it, it's very useful because then you end up uh, getting familiar with the, with, with the area. Obviously, you want to write the review, and you like to write the review article, and, and, Research interest, but if you write a review article with somebody who's prominent in the field, uh, and it will likely be so hot and hot cited a lot, and, uh, and, and um, it doesn't go very far in terms of tenure, but I think in terms of getting your name out there in the field, because uh, others will cite that work if it's, if it's a good quality review article. So I think uh, I was, I ended up writing a lot very early just because uh, um, a few then I got a bit savvier than we ended up. Uh, William Adwell written that he was the one the last one I wrote was uh, I think has been pretty important when it we got a lot of citations and as a result and I think that's uh, made me uh, a little bit more respected and at the same time probably a little bit more targeted in the field but that's you know I think that's probably that's I think that's that's um, I think it's an important step in terms of making you know making proper way in your in your field as well. I would say one of the best advices was to make sure that I knew the number of publications that I needed. You can kind of see that across different type of case, and maybe different for each mechanism. Um, but for my mentor award, it was good for me, and I guess that, that that's what I would tell people. You need to have X number of publications so that you're competitive, because you can always set up your mentors. You can always, you know, try to make that part of the application stronger by just writing it stronger. But you can't really change your publications once you go in. I mean, that's what you have, and that's what you're going in with. So having the the minimum number or what my mentor calls a foolproof number of publications. Um, obviously, I think the more the better. And I, you know, if there's a couple of review papers in there, that also helps. Uh, even if there's like case reports, I mean, sometimes just by looking at the papers, they don't necessarily will, can tell what's what. But it just kind of gives them an idea that you've been doing something with your time while you were a resident, while you were a fellow, or whatever you're doing as a postdoc or a PhD, that you're just not sitting around, but you're doing <coughs> your research at the same time. You're able to write and you're able to publish. So I, I think knowing when you apply you to have X number of publications, to me, it was a very good advice. I mean, I think if, especially in terms of just showing master that if you're able to write a review article or something from my perspective, it shows that you, you're, you're staying up with the field, you're, 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 you're aware of what other, you know, in the you want to write the balance, you're aware of what others are writing and how, uh, how others are contributing to your field. And I think it, it's very useful. It, it actually, it actually makes you makes you pull pull up articles that might actually it might have not been that might have missed it. If you did that, you don't really, your science doesn't benefit from that too. So uh, I wouldn't make a habit of it again, but if it one or two and I think it's, it's a good idea as well. As they get pointed out just in terms of uh it look good on your C V too and it is it something uh, again just to show that you are you're busy, that you're productive, that you're also uh, again gaining your mastery in that field. I have just one more question, and then we can see if there are any more that have been generated here. Um, what departmental or institutional resources did you use while you were applying your case that were particularly helpful, and what do you wish had been available in preparing your application? 
Thank you, sir. I think what I think the main resource I used was the photocopier and uh, paper because this is before the electronic submission. Uh, my vision at that time was not again all that savvy about K Ward. It's just because we were very good at producing private practitioners. But uh, I think uh, ultimately, I think uh, as I was going through the second prompt, uh, the, the revision, we ended up becoming more aware of okay, look, there's all these things that Duke has to offer the, the faculty development program. Uh, and now the Department of Medicine, in particular, we have a, a faculty development academy, these types of things that, that are all around Duke. Uh, that that you, you, go, you go to these things, like the, again, the go and write a course, uh, you go to go to these things, but you actually should write down in your table that you're going to these things, because these actually these things are things that Duke provides, this the infrastructure here to, to help people advance it. You just, you, you may not think of putting it, you may not be relevant to K, but it, it's actually very relevant in it for the, for, uh, I think the gentleman up there asked about progress reports. This, these are things that you actually would put in your progress reports. Your progress reports not just about your research, it's about your, it's about your career development too. My the thing I found most useful was getting help with uh, the budget because putting together a budget is not something I don't have any experience with. So I was able to use resources, uh, deep resources, to help get the budget put together. And uh, what I wish I wish there had been more information from Duke specifically about cable ones. Um, maybe there was and I wasn't able to find it, but I felt like I was kind of a little lost when I was doing this last year. And I feel like now, now there's more, uh, there are more programs um, about case, but I felt a little, a little lost back then. So, uh, sometimes I think about all students who work after, you know, whether you can recruit patients or my clinical trial and stuff. And, uh, I, is that something I should be worrying about as, as much at that stage? Or, I mean, I won't, I won't be so happy if I get it. Can you advise on that? So I think it depends uh, on, on how you structure your care award. Um, I think a good combination, at least what we've done in our team, is that you propose things that are low hanging fruit. So if you have uh, access to databases or uh, some sort of secondary analysis of like, patients that have already been enrolled in their data for, that nobody's going to do anything with that, but you can actually turn it into an aim uh, and then maybe have a small trial as part of your component of the whole case. Because again, the whole thing is to train you in doing clinical trials. You're not going to propose a 200 patient clinical trials for the case because they're going to say that it doesn't make any sense. So trying to combine something that's already like there, so you can just, it, you don't depend upon enrolling patients, something that they can see, you're going to learn something from that and you're going to be successful right away because it's just there. And a lot of it is actually provided by your mentors. So if your mentor has access to those kind of things, then that's helpful. And then proposing a clinical trial that's really, really feasible. You know, it doesn't have, I mean, for me, I do pediatrics. So if we do a patient, that's, you know, everybody's clapping for it. So uh, that's kind of easy for us. So often we'll propose a trial that's less than 50 patients uh, in size and that will pretty much do it in terms of learning how to do a clinical trial. So I would just, I think part of the key good theme is feasibility. You want to propose something that you can do as a trainee, is you consider you as being in training and not really over promise things that you're never going to be able to do. That's very helpful because, yeah, I sometimes worry that it won't be powered or whatever, and, you know, but I don't want to promise something too much that's, you know, I'll be overwhelmed. So. So eight patients can be okay, or whatever, 16? Right. I mean, you have to justify it, of course, but, and for my other research, that works, but I know that reviewers are going to pick on, there's no way you're going to be able to do a five-center trial with 100 patients, so.